the McLaren Thought Leadership Center. We are looking at how technology has the potential to revolutionize healthcare for us all. Our next guest is an entrepreneur with over 20 years experience in medicine, and he believes that as devices get smaller, the opportunities to empower patients get larger. Well, Holla, you gave me an assignment to immerse myself in wearables, so that's exactly what I've done for the past week. But my real question was, can these machines tell me more than I know about my own body? All right, I gotta get up. I wanna see what this thing says about my sleep on the Fitbit. So I haven't even gotten to work yet and I've already logged 10,000 steps. So I'm tracking everything about me with these wearables this week, uh, from my exercise to my relaxation or lack thereof and down to the nitty gritty of my vital signs. Do you have the directions? Okay. Digo algo pequeño cuando falten. Well, I've been trying to use these wearables at home every day, which is actually where I'm most relaxed. Now I just finished CNN in Espanol. I'm about to switch back to CNN in English, and this is really my most stressful time of day. So I'm going to try and do one of the relaxation sessions. Oh. I forgot to turn it on, let me do that first. I'm just gonna do a five minute beach session. So, I don't think I need a wearable to tell me that I'm absolutely songs from this class. And I have the mother of all wearables, the Check Me Pro. It measures all types of things that are going on in your body, starting with your temperature, the pedometer, or you can stick your finger in here and it will tell you your pulse. It also works as an ECG, an electrocardiogram. So this is how deep wearable technology goes, telling me data that I really didn't think I ever needed and don't know I will need it until I'm a senior citizen. Okay, I saw more of Samuel than I ever have in that <laughs> So what was the one piece of technology that most impressed you, that you found most useful? It was the complete opposite of what I thought. I thought the wearables would be what I liked the most in terms of steps, how many miles I was going, and it was actually the meditation device mm -hmm. because it really made me set aside five minutes every day and it reads your brain waves, it says, and it makes noises when your brain isn't clear. And I found it to be really accurate when I was thinking about work or stress it made these noises and I said, okay, I got to clear my mind and I found it to be really effective. And it worked for you, that one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, you can't tell I'm less stressed at work all of a sudden? <laughs> you're, not, you're not a stressed guy anyway. Thanks very much, Samuel. That was actually really interesting. Um, Dr. Daniel Kraft is the faculty chair uh, for medicine at Singularity University and the founding executive director and chair of Exponential Medicine. Thanks for being with us. So. Wearable, now I have this, this is nothing. I mean, this is obviously technology that's meant several, I have a Fitbit, I have a pedometer I wear. But let's talk a little bit about the future of what wearables could, could do for us all. Yeah, well, we're still in this early age of wearables. You know, I'm wearing four on my wrists, one on my finger. Uh, you can have them embedded into your homes, into your cars. So we're at this early age. The first Fitbits only came out, you know, seven or eight years yeah. ago. We're only 10 years into the smartphone era. So technology is moving exponentially, getting smaller, cheaper, more available. And none of us want to be checking every single device on our wrist or having 10 apps. Where I think these things are heading is more to converge the data yeah. So that becomes actionable own, 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 owned by you. Not just the quantified self geeks out there who want the data, but can go to quantified health, flow to your clinician. Even the NHS is starting to prescribe wearables and connected blood pressures. And but it's not a substitute for a doctor's visit, no, obviously. No, but it's but it become part of our tool as empowered individuals. And the new drug is the empowered us to own our data, hopefully donate it as data donors so that as we connect to the Internet of Things, similar to our modern cars, we heard the McLaren Center, the cars in our modern cars today have hundreds of sensors. We don't know about any one sensor, but we care when our check engine light goes on, and hopefully like, that makes us proactive to go check into the mechanic. Mm -hmm. The same principle will come to the future of healthcare, particularly as the dots get connected, we start to measure and analyze with artificial intelligence and machine learning. So that's not just raw data. What do you do with your sleep data? What does your sleep mattress sensor tell you that your resting heart rate's gone from 55 to 80? Something else might be going on. Can you be more specific? 
What types of illnesses, what types of things that you can monitor with wearable could help us stay fitter, healthier in the future? Well, if you think in most of our healthcare systems around the world, they're really sick care. We spend most of our dollars on folks after they have disease. With yeah. these new wearables and beyond, to incitables and trainables, we can get more continuous data and be much more proactive to optimize yourself for a triathlon, or if you have something like diabetes or heart disease, use that to manage your blood sugars and your medications. So where this But that's when you already know you have heart disease or diabetes. What about, for instance, something that could give you a clue as to, as to what might be wrong? Right. Right. We're hitting this check engine light for the body era, where yeah. you'll hopefully again get that nudge early. Uh, a Stanford professor recently published from his wearables that he picked up that he had Lyme disease uh, and wouldn't have picked that up for maybe weeks or months later. We're seeing the ability of Wi-Fi in our homes to mm -hmm. measure vital signs. So we're going to enter an era where our digital exhaust, whether we like it or not, is being collected and collated and sometimes shared. Um, and where this can take us is like our 10 years ago, we didn't have smartphones or, or online maps. Now we couldn't imagine driving without Google Maps or Waze. Part of this future will be sharing our data, just like our speed and location, and building those healthcare maps and using those to tell us, hey, take this yeah. route versus the other. Healthcare. This could be a big problem for hypochondriacs, so by the way. They might pick up on signs that aren't there. But um, can this eliminate the, the lab process in some, in some cases? In some cases, you know, vital signs are interesting, but we have lots of other data that in fact our health span, it's not just our vital signs, it's our connected friends and family, our mm -hmm. financial health and beyond. We can now test, for example, urine. You can, I've got things in my pockets here. Uh, <laughs> instead of taking your urine to the lab or going to the clinic, you could dip a little dipstick like this, okay. take a picture with your smartphone, looks at the colors and reports that back to your clinician and healthcare system. Right. Uh, ways to democratize uh, these diagnostics around the world, particularly in the era of pandemics, where we're one flight away from the next Ebola or H1N1. What's the ring you're wearing? This is a ring from Finland called the Aura Ring. It tracks sleep. Sleep is something which is often underappreciated. It has an impact on our obesity, on mental state, on risk for cancers. And with a simple connected ring now, I can look at how much time I'm in REM sleep, deep sleep, uh, how much uh, jet lag I have flying from the States. Mm. Um, that's an example of lots of convergent co technology coming together and how we might leverage this if this gets paid for, if the health system around you might prescribe this, if you can show But what if things? healthcare companies, I mean, I could take, you know, look at it differently. Healthcare companies or insurance companies gather the data and for instance, you know, charge you more or deny you even coverage because there's, of data they can collect. There's definitely the challenge of the Big Brother era, including with your genomics. Go watch the movie Gattaca from 20 yeah. years ago to see the implications there. The potential is this, these can leverage our behaviors. Not everyone needs, needs the same wearable app. We need to tune the feedback loops to our age, our language, our culture. Some people want points, some people want badges, some people want social cred. Part of these new digital technologies won't just give us data, but give us coaching and nudge us in the right directions. And as, the, as, we, have, as we have AI mm -hmm. avatars, through VR, AR, our home mirrors that give us, or through our you know, Amazon Echoes, mm -hmm. we're gonna see our health become integrated through our consumer devices and allow us to be much more preventative. Samuel, you have questions from the audience. Paul, I'm really glad that William has this question because I think I had my own uh, misdiagnosis when I was using the heart monitor. Oh. Yeah. I wondered if, um, do you ever worry about people kind of misdiagnosing themselves, maybe if their technology breaks and they think they're kind of dying and actually there's nothing wrong with them or they might um, go and seek a cure themselves that might cause them more problems? That's a great question, actually. Right. A lot of these consumable or wearables today are, are not sort of FDA or, or regulatory approved, but sometimes it doesn't matter if you're 10,000 steps or 10,200, but for something like an EKG, and now you can put an EKG sensor you know, directly on your smartphone case and collect a full on EKG, that's been FDA cleared. You can actually buy it online. That can enable you to diagnose atrial fibrillation or other funny heart rhythms. Um, I think overall, this will enable <coughs> you to be much more on top of your health data, uh, to bring it to your clinician or send it there telepresently. They may even call you ahead of time before you even know you're having a condition or worsening. So kind of that, that check engine light, red, green, blue element. Mm -hmm. um, there are downsides. Again, the privacy issue. We can use other technologies like blockchain to help make data more secure and less hackable. Um, and overall, again, if we can connect the dots between data sets, we don't need new technologies. We need to incentivize sharing and data donors to build those sort of Google driving maps for healthcare. Mm -hmm. And Samuel, more questions? Yeah, Hall, as I was using these wearables, I was doing a lot of research, speaking to a lot of experts, and every single piece of literature that I saw said, there's no way any of these can replace a doctor for now. It's all about doing it in conjunction with the doctor. And Monica, I know you have a question. Hi, Dr. Kraft. I was wondering which one of the new technologies, in your opinion, has the highest potential to have impact on healthcare and biomedicine in the future? I think, great question, but it's all individualized on you. There's no one best technology. It may be a connected scale that uh, reminds you about staying on track. It may be 
your smartphone with an app that can listen to your voice and look at your emotional states. Uh, mental health, such an important measure, can be done through our connected devices. Excellent. Samuel? So our next question is uh, from Barbara, and it's actually a question that I always have whenever I'm reporting on technology, whether it's medicals or any other type uh, of device, really. Uh, Dr. Kraft, what I wanted to know is that with health, there's so many social and wider social determinants of health. And so these apps that we have, are they going to be reliable in determining what is actually going on? Because there could be so much more beyond what that tech is just showing at that particular time. Is that taken into consideration? I think the future of medicine is to be much more holistic and integrate data. It might be, uh, again, your, you know, you put a FICO scores, look at your financial health from multiple angles. That goes with healthcare as well. It's not just your genomics, but it's your behavioral data. It's your social network strength. Uh, if you're socially isolated and are lonely, that's uh, as risky as two packs a day of smoking. Is so, it really? Yeah. So we need to start paying attention to all these other elements. Um, I'm, a, I'm trained in internal medicine and pediatrics. Getting kids when they're young to stay on top of the right diet, um, eat the right foods can make a huge difference down, downstream. And and as we start to collect this data, again, we've had none of this vital science, this digital health data in the past. We can start to, again, identify someone early, tune them in the right direction, give them that sort of GPS for healthcare. Daniel, don't go right to the gym, go right to the yoga class. Right. And uh, Or to use, as we saw earlier, you know, a brain-connected oh, interface. Oh, every one of your pockets yeah. has a wear. Life, right? Because, I mean, is there a danger here that all this technology is actually isolating us from human contact? That really seeing your doctor or going to your pharmacist or all those things are what also keep us healthy, that human contact. As you just spoke about, I don't think we're going to replace physicians with robots or AI. It'll be a blend, not artificial intelligence, but intelligence augmentation. I may see you in the clinic, mm -hmm. and as a follow-up, I'll send you uh, tweets and digital empathy and can follow up on your procedure and see how you're doing. Uh, we're going to need, again, this combination of human skills. We can use, you know, the augmented reality of today. This is already an antique, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, it can be used uh, for a breastfeeding mother to learn how to breastfeed or for a kid with autism to learn emotional states. Yeah. So we can be, do smart design work. Technology has to be integrated with our lives and meet the person where they are, something that's going be uh, deployed in, in Africa might be different than yeah. if it's here in London. You know, we live in this exponential age with what looks magical 10 years ago. You know, I've got my antique, you know, iPhone 2 in my pocket. It will look antique today. Yeah. Where will these be in two and five years? Where will AI, robotics, 3D printing, nanotech be, low-cost genomics? Where's it converging? And each of you are trying to think about your own health and inventing new technologies or uh, those of your family, friends and family. Think about where technology will be in 2020, 2025, how it comes together and play a role in reinventing health and medicine, whether you're a physician, nurse, or biotechnology. It's a really brave new world now to put these together in smart ways. Thank you very much, Dr. Daniel Kraft, and to all of our guests and audience members, thanks to all of you as well for joining us at the McLaren Thought Leadership Center. From Samuel and myself, goodbye.